guest speaker today. We've got Dr. Addie Wooten, who's going to be talking about sexuality and prostate cancer. She's a clinical psychologist within the Department of Urology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and her clinical work involves the provision of psychological assessment and intervention to patients and their partners living with prostate cancer, bladder cancer, and other urological conditions. Issues addressed primarily include anxiety, depression and adjustment difficulties as well as erectile dysfunction, masculine identity and relationship difficulties. Addie is involved in a range of research projects investigating the psychosocial impact of cancer as well as the provision of psychological therapy to improve psychological outcomes. She has authored several scientific papers as well as a book chapter and, diff and patient information booklets. We're just delighted that Addie's here today for a different reason, and we've managed to nab her for our public lecture today. So I ask you to join me in welcoming her for today's session. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm not a medical specialist. Bear that in mind when you think about your questions. So I am going to talk about what I do a little um, bit of the time in terms of helping men work through the, the difficulties that they face in the context of prostate cancer and also with their partners. Um, so I'll get started. There will be questions at the end. So if you want to, uh, if you've got a burning question, feel free to put your hand up, but otherwise we'll wait to the end. Um, you guys are probably all very familiar with the, the stats, um, but I thought I'd start off just setting the scene. Um, so prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Australia. Um, and about 20,000 men are diagnosed across Australia each year. Um, and hopefully my stats are up to date, but I think about 1,800 men are diagnosed per year in Western Australia. Um, so it's a, it's a huge number of men. It's about one in seven men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. It's good to see though that mortality rates are decreasing. And so men are living longer with prostate cancer and survival is really high. So about 92 to 95% of men will survive a long time um, after they're diagnosed with prostate cancer. But you can see on that bar chart um, that this, this cancer is one of the biggest cancers that we're facing. So even more men are diagnosed with prostate cancer than breast cancer um, and other things, uh, other cancers like bowel cancer. So it's, a, it's an important issue. Unfortunately, Australia has the highest incidence in the world. Um, so on this graph, you can see the white, the lighter colours are a higher prevalence. So we're even higher than uh, countries like the, um, the uh, United States or uh, Europe. So it's a worry for us in terms of uh, the number of men that are being diagnosed every year. And so the impact of prostate cancer, I think, I can sort of group into three areas. Um, I'm not sure if this image is the best image, but for those of you who don't know where the prostate is, it's situated right in the middle of your pelvis, underneath your bladder. Um, and it's obviously only, only an organ that men have. Um, and so if we look at the three different areas that I sort of have grouped in, uh, into different topics, we can see that there's, there are physical impacts, there are emotional impacts, and there are relationship impacts. And so what I'm going to talk about today is mostly around the emotional and the relationship impacts, but particularly link the physical to those emotional and relationship impacts. Um, I, I'm, I've been working in prostate cancer for quite a long time now and I'm always struck by how men and women are different. Um, and I'm sure you'll all agree with me that men and women are different, but when it comes to the problems that people rate in terms of their dealing with cancer, um, men and women rate different things as important. Um, so you can see there on the right hand side, um, women rate fatigue and sleeping and pain as their top three. Um, for, similarly for men, there's fatigue, finances, sleeping are the, it's still in the top three. But the one big thing that is different uh, in this um, study is the fact that men rate sexual functioning as a big problem. And for women, it doesn't even come up in the top ten. Um, and so that led me to think about, well, what is it about sexual problems that... Um, strike a chord so uh, personally for men. And I think um, I'm going to talk a little bit about 
how uh, the impact on sexual functioning isn't just a physical problem, but it actually also impacts on how men feel about themselves, their self-esteem, their sense of masculinity. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for us to consider, and it's po probably a topic that doesn't really get discussed that much in general uh, hospital care. Now, when you think about sex, some pe people might think that men are pretty simple. Women, maybe not so simple. Um, but I don't actually think that this is the case. Um, the sexual impact of prostate cancer comes in many, many guises. So if you think about prostate cancer, there are direct physical impacts. So there are, there are issues with erectile functioning. Um, there's a, for men who have had surgery, they, there's a loss of ejaculate fluid. There might be penile shortening, there might be penile curvature, painful orgasm and loss of libido. So these are all direct physical impacts that can happen after prostate cancer treatment. Um, and I, I stress the importance of treatment here. So the prostate cancer in general um, doesn't cause these side effects unless you leave it a very long time and it, it ends up uh, spreading and uh, causing an impact. But it's generally the treatments that have a big impact. But if you think about the indirect impact of uh, sexual problems after prostate cancer treatment, um, you can think about things like body image. So how do you feel about your body? Sense of self-esteem. We know that um, people experience, or men experience, uh, mood disorders. So they might experience depression or anxiety be uh, related to their sexual problems. Um, and there's also other physical problems, so incontinence and fatigue that also have an impact on sexuality. So for a man who's experiencing incontinence, he's more, or sorry, less likely to feel sexually um, empowered and, and willing to be uh, sexual if he's experiencing incontinence, and likewise for fatigue. So if we look at the literature, the stats are all over the place. We don't really know exactly what percentage uh, of men suffer from sexual problems after prostate cancer treatment, but I would probably say that every single man who has treatment for prostate cancer will have some degree of sexual change. Whether it's the loss of ejaculate or whether it's uh, difficulty getting an erection, I think every man will have an impact. So this study, which is actually quite a, an old study, but it's a nice study because they actually asked people about how they felt about their experience after they had uh, treatment for prostate cancer. And about 45% of men reported that they had low sexual desire, so that's that feeling of um, libido or that, that sense of wanting to be sexual. 85% um, uh, rated that they, they had a problem with their sexual uh, functioning, um, and about 65% reported that they had a problem with orgasm. And so that, I think, is a, a significant thing to think about because we don't often talk about that when we're uh, in the clinic. I, I, I haven't met too many urologists that actually ask their patients about how they're feeling, you know, are they able to reach orgasm? Um, and you can see there that about a third of men had given up, they thought, they thought well, I'm not even going to try. Um, and so that gives us a, an indication that this, the sexual impact is much broader, perhaps, than just being able to get an erection or not. Um, so hopefully, if you have gone through the prostate cancer experience, you know that there are medical, uh, many medical treatments. So there are tablets, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and they're taken um, orally, obviously, they're tablets, and they work by... They basically work to try and um, mimic the normal sexual process. So when you take a tablet, you have to then do something that arouses you. You can't just wait and hope that it'll work. The injections are a little bit more intensive and so they actually work straight away. Um, but that involves injecting something, a, a substance into the penis that causes the erection. There are vacuum devices, which um, you can get, there's a whole range of different vacuum devices, but they actually use a vacuum um, to draw blood into the penis. And um, then you use a constriction band, so a little rubber band that you place at the base of the penis that traps the blood in there. 
And then there are penile prosthesis or implants. And so these are permanent implants that go into the penis that um, you, fit, you manually pump up um, and down when you want to have an erection. So there, there's lots of different options, um, but they're all quite um, medical, aren't they? They're not something that you just feel spontaneous and you, you get into the mood and, you, and you're able to be physically intimate. Um, they require a fair bit of adjustment and practice to get used to. And many men give up on them. So we know that uh, at least 50% of men will be pres prescribed the, the tablets and give up in the first few months after starting them. Um, and many men are dissatisfied with how, th how these uh, all work. Uh, and I think that's probably because we don't talk to people enough. Um, often uh, men will get a prescription and sent home and they might come back to their specialist six months later and get a check in and out to see how they're going, but often we don't actually talk to people about what's working and what's not working. We also know that very few men recover uh, erectile functioning without medical intervention. Um, so this is an, an, another nice little study actually from um, America, not from Australia, but it, it was really nice because they asked men whether they could get an, uh, an erection with or without medication, and then they broke it down to men who were over 60 and men who were under 60. And you can see there that the, the group that were using medication went much better than the men who weren't using medication. But you can also see there that the men who were under 60 did a lot better than the men who were over 60. And that suggests that there's a physical component, so the, the nerves and the, uh, and the blood flow um, obviously deteriorates as men get older, but also that medications um, are, are important to use. And, and that's not to say that uh, um, men over 60 should give up on being sexually active, because I don't believe that at all. These are the oral medications, and what it suggests is that perhaps men who are older might benefit more from different medications, not the oral tablets. But I would stress that it, it's very individual, and everyone should start off with the tablets if you're, if you're trying to start that process of recovery. The other thing we know is that um, men uh, in general are not very satisfied with the care that they get. Now that's a very big statement um, and of course there will be very good care in some places and not very good care in other places so it sort of evens out over, uh, over Australia. But this is a study from New South Wales that found that about half of the men had a unmet needs in relation to how they felt, so their psychological care, and about just under half had unmet needs in relation to their sexual um, life, basically. And so this was a pretty big study. They surveyed about a thousand men, um, which is a big study for Australia. And so it said to me, when I read this, I thought, oh, maybe we're not helping people the way we should be. Maybe giving men the, these medical devices isn't enough. And so in my clinical practice, I hear uh, comments like this. I just don't seem to have any desire anymore. Do you think my testosterone's okay? And so that sense of maybe it's a physical problem. Then I often hear comments about, I'm scared that she's going to find someone else. I worry all the time that she might move on and, and find another partner because I can't satisfy her. I just can't bear to let her down so I don't go there at all. And I, for this man, he might have stopped being intimate at all. And then comments that are more general, like we've stopped doing nice things together, even going out for dinner or holding hands. And so there's that sense sometimes of withdrawal. And certainly a sense of not feeling like a man anymore, or that sense of a loss of something. So I think it's more than mechanics. Um, sexuality, I, I think, is a central component to how we view ourselves as adults. And often we don't think about sexuality or sexual relationships. It's just something that happens and it's usually quite a private thing. Um, but in the context of prostate cancer, I think it becomes a much more um, obvious thing. And for men, I think it's, a symbolic, it's symbolic of masculinity and a key component of identity. 
Uh, for most of us, as we age, and um, particularly within our relationships, we develop a sense, uh, um, a reliable sense of being a sexual being. And so it might be just something that you take for granted, um, you don't really ever think about. And it is related, as I have said before, to confidence, self-esteem and connectedness to others. So in one study, um, they surveyed men and asked them how it impacted on um, their general life. And so the, the, uh, the men in this study said that uh, their loss of sexual functioning had impacted them in four different areas. And it's interesting, it, it impacted them on their sense of self and their masculinity. It Im impacted on their sense of uh, sexual confidence and their sense of fantasy and you know, sort of thinking about sexual things. But this study was interesting because it also identified that it in, these men said that it impacted them in terms of how they relate to people in general. They felt, these men felt that in general they just didn't feel as confident, they didn't want to talk to people like they had before. And so I think it, it's, it, it taps into something that's quite personal. Um, and we know that there's a big link between physical functioning and emotional functioning, um, and particularly in terms of anxiety and depression and how that relates then to relationships. And there's certainly, I think, for a lot of men, shame when erection problems occur. So that can lead to avoidance, so that sense of, well, I'm just not going to... I won't initiate anything, I'll back right off and hope that it all gets better. The other thing I think that plays into how people cope uh, later on is expectations. So um, there's, a, there's a, a whole lot of research that's now um, showing that what you expect before you have treatment in terms of your physical functioning will impact on how you cope later on. Um, so I, I think this suggests that we need to make sure that people are, um, well, I think, the man and his partner need to be informed um, and educated about what to expect after treatment. Um, and what we have found is that most men, when they surveyed before they have treatment, is that they overestimate how well they're going to do later on. So in one study, um, the, the men that they surveyed actually thought that they would be about almost almost 50% better than what they actually were 12 months after treatment. And so th basically, this study, what this study said is, imagine you're 12 months after surgery, how, how well do you think you're going to be going? And most men felt that they thought that they would be going really, really well. And unfortunately, when they surveyed them at 12 months after surgery, they weren't going as well as what they had originally expected. And this related really strongly to how distressed men felt. So if you felt that you weren't going as well as what you should be, then that was a big, that had a big impact on how men felt. Now, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about masculinity and identity. Um, and I think it's, it's important because um, it's, it is more than biological um, differences. It's, it, I think our sense of um, masculinity and femininity comes from our culture and our environment. Um, as well as our personal experience. And I think it's so, it, I use the term masculine identity to, to describe what a man feels um, it means to be a man. And so this will be slightly different for everybody, um, but our culture has a lot to do with it. Now, um, for a while, I'm from Melbourne, so don't hold that against me, but for a while we had big billboards like this all over Melbourne, promoting, um, medical treatments for erectile d dysfunction. Um, and it sort of suggested to me that we were a culture that really wanted everyone to have sex, long-lasting sex, and they could do it whenever they wanted to, and, you know, really terrible slogans. And luckily for us, they got banned and they got taken down. Um, but it's interesting when you think about our culture, if we value um, sex in that way, it has a subtle, hopefully a very subtle, but sometimes a noticeable impact on what you believe yourself to be important in terms of sexual intimacy. And the other things we have are movies. Um, so often masculinity is described as, you know, being masculine and strong, maybe being a handyman and good at everything. Um, 
And I, I know this, this is a generalisation, there's lots of different ways to, to describe masculinity, but I think when we look at our culture, these are some of the common things. And so unfortunately what that means is that we use these stereotypes and we filter them down and they become a sense of what we think we should be. Um, and I think that has a big impact in the context of prostate cancer because often men talk about feeling less of a man or less strong um, or a, a not as good a husband or partner anymore. So there's social definitions and what, um, what we do sometimes um, when, we, when I talk to people, so as a psychologist, we think about what are the thought processes, what are the, the statements that you're saying to yourself that could be um, having an impact on how you feel. So the shoulds and musts about being a real man <coughs> So if, you're, if you think about your own thought processes, are you thinking that you have to be able to have an erection in order to be a good husband? So those sorts of statements we try and break down. And as I said before, the locus of um, masculinity is often physical and so prostate cancer I think challenges that sense of masculinity in a couple of ways. Obviously the sexual impact, but also being diagnosed with a cancer is you know, something that can challenge that as well. Your body, you might feel that your body has let you down. Um, or even uh, living with incontinence might be a big challenge physically. You might have to wear a pad or you might have to go to the bathroom many more times than you used to. And so that sense of being strong, being able to in, endure those bodily stresses, to be the provider, the protector, self-sufficient, and a sense of being in control, I think are all key things to looking at masculinity. Um, the other thing I notice when I'm talking to men is that often they say to me that they shouldn't be feeling the way they feel um, and that emotional expressiveness is a bit of a weakness for them. Um, and so I spend a lot of time challenging that idea that expressing how you feel is actually a sign of weakness because I, in fact I think telling somebody ha that you're feeling down or that you're struggling is probably a sign of strength because you're actually saying that you need a bit of a hand. So to put it in a diagrammatic form, um, I, I think looking at prostate cancer, you can see that erectile dysfunction or that sense of loss of libido or even just changes in sensation can sometimes challenge masculine beliefs. And so that can lead to a sense sometimes of feeling like you're not a a, a good partner or I'm not the man I used to be. And that can lead to depression or anxiety or a sense of agitation or withdrawal or, and a whole range of other different feelings. And so you can see that there's a, there's a chain of events that happens. So um, I wouldn't uh, be a psychologist if I didn't care about how people felt. And I, so I think it's also important um, for you guys to have a think about the emotional impact. So we know that um, cancer of any type will have a big impact emotionally. Of course, any life-threatening illness will challenge how you feel. Um, but we also know that in prostate cancer, there's a really high rate um, of psychological distress. But we also know that depression um, or depressive symptoms tend to be underreported. Um, and one really alarming thing from my point of view is that the suicide rate for men with prostate cancer in some of the studies that have been published are about four times higher than the, the men the same age. So there's a really big risk, I think, um, that I certainly need to pay attention to, to make sure that men don't bottle things up and then take the most drastic steps. Um, so I think um, if you're not aware of what the signs and symptoms are of anxiety and depression, I think it's worth getting to know um, ab about them, just so that you can be aware and, and start that conversation earlier rather than leave it too long. Um, and I think the main things for men are actually looking at um, more the uh, irritability and agitation type symptoms rather than the, the sense of feeling really sad and telling people how sad you feel. I think men and women display depression a little bit differently. So if you found that you're irritable more often or that you get frustrated and agitated more often than you used to 
or that you've withdraw, uh, drawn from your normal activities, I think they're really important things to pay attention to. I also think if you're um, using alcohol or drugs more than what you used to, then that is a problem as well. It's usually a sign that you're covering things up with um, increased alcohol, for example. And the other thing I notice is that talking to men um, they're sometimes more likely to talk about their physical complaints. So you maybe complain of an upset stomach or, or back pain or tension in your shoulders um, more than perhaps women do. So I think there's some, there's some signs to keep an, an eye out for. Um, and I think in general men can have that tendency to turn inward when emotionally distressed rather than telling everybody about it. So if you find or you have a mate that has sort of closed down or retreated a little bit and he's not coming out and enjoying things with you like he used to, maybe check him on him and ask him how he's going. The other very, very important factor, I think, is the impact on partners. Um, we, we know that there are higher rates of psychological distress for partners. Um, so I, um, there's really nice research from um, one of the groups in Melbourne who actually interviewed men and their partners, um, and they found that the partners really had a difficult time. Um, now, it's not a physical problem that they're going through themselves, but seeing someone that they care for really, really impacted, uh, care for going through prostate cancer, impacted on how they felt. Um, we don't know, though, whether it is actually more distressing or whether partners are more likely to tell us as researchers how they're going. Um, but we certainly know that there's a fear of losing a spouse. Um, there's worry about the cancer coming back. Um, and there's a, a big um, factor, I think, is not necessarily the loss of sexual uh, functioning for the partners, but that sense of a loss or withdrawal from the intimacy in the relationship. So partners often talk about feeling like they've lost their mate because they, they're not doing the things that they used to do and they're not spending as much time together. Um, so I think there's a big impact. Um, and often there's a sense that part, or some, for some partners that they can't speak about difficult uh, issues. So there might be a sense that um, uh, for some partners, especially if, if the sexual um, relationship has, has dried up a little bit and they've stopped, they've stopped being intimate, sometimes, sometimes partners talk about feeling that they don't want to upset the man. They don't want to start talking about those topics because they don't want to raise a, a topic that's obviously difficult to talk about. And for many couples, You've never. Most couples don't sit down over the dinner table and start talking about sex and intimacy. It's a it's a very uncommon conversation to have. Um, so often partners don't really know where to start that conversation. Um, and so when I talk to partners and couples, I often talk about well, how do, how can you start talking about that? What what do you say to somebody who is going through this? Um, and how do you get them talking about it? Um, so asking for support is a tricky one, I think, um, because I think obviously men need more support than just a script for Viagra or any of the other medical interventions. But I also know that men are reluctant to speak about their problems. Um, there was, this is an interesting study um, in, from South Australia where they asked men and their partners, how do you think prostate cancer impacted on your sense of masculinity? And Men said, about 40% of men said, yep, it's impacted on how I feel about myself. Um, but about 70% of partners said, actually, it's impacted on him a lot. So if you have a partner and they keep saying, I'm not sure you're going OK, I think I'm a bit worried about you, maybe they're onto something. Um, maybe have a chat about why, that, why your partner thinks that you need a bit of help. Um, the re what we don't know is why men have a reluctance to ask for help. Um, I'm, we all have our theories, um, but I'm sure there's stigma and there's probably a bit of fear. Um, there's certainly probably a lack of awareness about what services you can actually get help from. Um, and I think there's certainly a culture in the medical setting. I know in um, our hospital, when, when guys come back to see the urologist, they probably only have five minutes with the specialist. And so it's really rushed. You don't get a chance to ask all the questions that you want to ask. And often you're guided by what the urologist asks you, so you don't 
get to the really important stuff. But it might have something to do with male character as well. Now, so do you think, is it just the fact that men are stubborn or is it more than that? And this is a, I don't really know which country this comes from, but it's, I've seen it on a few uh, different slides, but I think it summarises it really nicely. Is it stubbornness? Um, I don't think it's just stubbornness. I think it's the whole, uh, lots of different things that feed into making sure we get the, the support to the right people at the right time. And so I think our um, health system really should provide care on these three main levels. So physical, obviously that's our number one aim is to fix the cancer, get rid of it and make sure your life is okay. But then I think we also need to look at the psychological um, and the, the behavioural side of things. So very briefly, um, you've probably already got a sense for what sort of stuff I do when I'm talking to people. But in general, a psychologist um, isn't there to read your mind. They're not going to diagnose you and send you off to a, the madhouse. Um, really, psychologists are there just to talk and to help you understand what's going on and how you feel. Um, often we have more time than um, a medical specialist. So we, we have, uh, I usually see people for a full hour, not five minutes. Um, and so we talk about beliefs and attitudes and thoughts about how you're going with your cancer, um, the impact on, on your identity, so, and then understanding where emotions might be coming from. So sometimes people feel really tense but haven't figure out, figured out why they feel anxious or tense or stressed. Um, and I think that knowledge and understanding is really powerful. So once you sort of can get a grip on where, you, where you're at and why, why you're feeling a certain way, you can actually do things that, that will help you. Um, and I spend a lot of time with couples um, talking about new ways of being intimate. So um, how do you restart that sexual relationship after you've had prostate cancer? Um, it's not going to be the same as what it was before treatment. Um, and I think it's it takes a long time to adjust to that and to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, so what we do in, in terms of um, starting to navigate and, and figure out what your sexual relationship's going to be like now is that we talk about the goalposts. Uh, goal I'm from Melbourne, so we're very obsessed by football. Um, so I use the goalpost analogy probably way too much. Um, but um, setting expectations about what, what are you aiming for? So if, you, if you've had surgery and you're six months out from after surgery um, and you're having problems with getting an erection, how can you still be intimate without aiming to have um, sex like you used to? What are the other things that you can do that are still enjoyable for you and your partner? Um, and how can you develop a plan to work on that? Um, so we talk about, well, what, what is good sex? So why, why do adults have sex? They're either going to have sex because they want to have kids or they're having sex just because it's enjoyable. And so normally we have, we, I talk to couples about, well, how are you actually going to enjoy being intimate again? Um, I think it's really important for couples to work together on this. And um, sometimes I find that we perhaps don't invite the partners in enough to our me um, medical uh, consults and so they feel a little bit left out. And so I think actually getting both members of the couple to come in and talk about it is really important. Um, communication, I think, is really the key. Um, and as I said before, it might be, have, might be the first time you've ever talked about um, sex and intimacy. And so starting that conversation takes a bit of time. Um, and the other thing is to think about how you behave with each other. So sometimes changing the, the way you do things can actually be helpful. So one of the questions I often ask couples is, well, who initiates sexual intimacy? Has it always been the man that initiates? Or could you switch it around? Could, you, could the partner initiate? Um, and as boring as it sounds, sometimes I think plans and schedules are useful. So actually booking in, saying, well, right, Wednesday night and Sunday morning are my two days where we're going to be intimate. And that gives you something to work with, I think. You can say, well, and especially if it's going to take a bit of um, fumbling around, especially with the injections, I think you do need to plan. Um, and then if you're feeling like 
expanding it a little bit more, you can think about different positions, different gels and creams and toys and a whole range of different things that you can bring into your um, relationship. But again, I think all of these things need to be done together, not just individually. The other thing I think it's worth thinking about is exercise. And you guys are lucky enough to have the best exercise um, uh, set up here at ECU. Um, and they've done some really good research looking at how exercise can impact on um, sexuality and sexual intimacy and sense of masculinity. Um, and they've just recently published a paper that um, told us that exercise directly taps into um, enhancements in masculine self-esteem. So for the guys that were doing exercise, they actually felt more, um, that they had a higher sex drive, so their libido improved. They also felt better in themselves. They felt like they were sort of getting back on track and connecting back into how they felt as a man. So, I mean, that's a really simple thing. You, we could all probably do more exercise. So, you know, thinking about, well, what, what could you improve in your life to make you feel better is really important. Now, conscious of the time. Um, so I think in terms of starting the conversation, if you have a question that hasn't been answered by your medical team, keep asking it. So don't give up on asking that question. And even if you have to write a list of different questions and go, sometimes I, some of the guys I talk to say, I've got 10 questions and I'm not leaving that urologist's office until he's answered every question. And I think, oh, good on you. Um, uh, talk to your partner about how you're going um, and think uh, I think that certainly it's it sounds easy but it is often hard o open communication is really really the best recipe to a good relationship now very briefly I'm going to play a quick video we've been I've been thinking um, about how we can get support out to um, men a little bit easier and obviously there's barriers to coming and talking to me not not too many guys put up their hand to say, yes, I want to go and talk to you. Um, so we started looking at wh whether we could use technology and the internet to, um, to help support guys. And we've developed a program called Prostmate, um, which there are some flyers out the front, um, but I'm just going to play you the, uh, it's like a one minute video just to give you an idea about what it is. Prostate cancer affects millions of men all over the world. We know about its many challenges, and how at times you may feel overwhelmed or lost. Prostmate is here to guide and support you through each step of your journey. It's a free online program developed by medical experts and researchers. We provide information relevant to you, specialists you can contact directly and a way to record your progress. Our tailored programs are developed to help you feel connected, informed and empowered. Prostmate brings the best information, advice and support directly to you, wherever you are. Your participation will help us shape the future of prostate cancer care. Visit prostmate.org.au and become a member now. So it's a little ad. Um, and it, it's a work in progress, so it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But what we're trying to do is use um, the online environment to give... Um, men who men and their partners or anyone affected by prostate cancer uh, an opportunity to use the tools that we know we, well we, we hope will be helpful so it it's um, it's a big research project so we're testing out different things and it's a collaborative um, group of us that have been working on this project now for for about three years so I'm just going to skip across but I'm going to show you a few of these screens so um, we found that lots of the websites that we um, have come across are quite overwhelming um, and so you, when you go on onto the website you're not really sure where you should be looking. Um, so we wanted to build something that was quite tailored. So Prostmate um, asks a few questions um, of everyone who comes to the website just, um, to, to try and tailor what we give to each person. Um, you have to become a member to um, get into Prostmate. It is all free um, but by collecting some of that information about you, we can actually tailor what we show you on your dashboard. And so there are um, five key different components of the program. The first one is the checkup, and that basically is a way for um, the system to check in on how you're going. And so we ask key questions from a, a five different domains. Uh, 
and it's I'll, and then it's graphed um, to show you how you're going over time. I'll show you that in a sec. And the other um, area that we're trialling is offering telehealth consultation, so either sort of Skype-based, a, a web video um, consultation or a phone consultation with a prostate cancer nurse or a psychologist, that is me, um, to see whether um, it actually we can reach out to people that might not normally get access to these types of services. Um, the library is grouped into different topics and so that it, that we've been really particular in grouping different things together so that it's uh, tailored to where people are at in their journey with prostate cancer, whether they're newly diagnosed or a long way through it. And it also gives you options to um, track how your treatments and PSA results and there's a little PSA graph that you can use to, to plot things over time. And the graph looks a little bit like this, um, depending on how much information you put into it. It also links through to other online programs. So we've developed um, an online psychological support program called My Road Ahead, and that's for men um, after they've had treatment for prostate cancer, and also a partner support program. Um, so if, if you're interested in having a look at those, you're more than welcome. Um, as I said, it's free, um, and it's, it's really a big tool that we've developed to try and test out new ideas. So we're really keen to figure out whether we can um, get su more support out to people um, in regional or rural areas, but also um, information out to, uh, to people that might not have a, a nurse or a psychologist in their normal practice. Um, so jump on and have a look if you like. And that's it. I went a bit over time. <laughs> up so that we can see a bit better and we'll get some uh, the roving mic around so that you can ask some questions directly into the microphone so that our regional people who can think our video can hear you. So yeah. Any questions? <laughs> okay, just to get the microphone to you. Hold on. We do. We have to record. Um, the medications that you, you say like Viagra and Cialysis two different compounds. One's sendenafil and the other one is tendenafil. What happens if you mix the two? Like on a Monday you take a Viagra, the next day you take a Cialysis. Can you mix the two? Uh, that's a good question. I wish I had studied medicine and then I could give you a 100% guaranteed answer. I would uh, I'd say you have to go and talk to your, your doctor about that. Um, definitely don't take two on the same day. Um, but I don't think there, I don't, I think you can try different ones on different days. There's, it has a half-life, so it wears off and goes out of your system, but double check with your... They all tell you something different. They, you are, it's like the, some of these drugs people take for depression, you've got to wait 10 or 15 days before you, or three yes. weeks before you, you can't mix and match. Yep, it's not that long, so the half-life isn't as long as, say, a, an antidepressant medication. It gets out of your system quicker, but double check with your doctor because so the the worst thing that could happen if you overdose on medications like that is that you have a priapism which means a I prolonged think, erection know, for know, many many hours which can cause a lot of damage but i know viagra don't last very long yeah and if people are overweight and they eat a lot of fat the viagra doesn't work exactly yeah so it depends on how your body metabolizes things so the cialysis is the best it stays in the system for 72 hours yeah that's why they call it the weekender <laughs> Listen, thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks. On your initial chart where you put up um, the differences between men and women, and you had, I think, 25% of men were, were rated uh, sexual activity or whatever yep. as important in cancer and it didn't rate within the women's top 10. I see that as one of the basic psychological problems that men have got. And so the question is, how do you breach that? I mean, the, the men often have the attitude that this is important for me, and if women are not interested in it to that extent, I mean, how do we overcome that problem? That is a really good question. And I think you're right. That's the one of the biggest challenges, as particularly as couples age, we know that the body changes. And so when women go through menopause, um, 
the hormone changes that happen can have a big impact on libido and sex drive. Um, I, don't have, I, I, I don't have the answer to it. And I think, um, I think the couples that I see that go the best and that can figure that, work through those sorts of differences are the couples that actually talk openly with each other and they don't bring up old baggage and they don't get angry at each other. They actually sit down and share how they feel and listen to each other and then figure out how they can work together to help each other. So I think, I mean, it's like, it, it really is like anything in life. If we, if one person thinks something and another person thinks a completely different thing, you, you'll knock heads until um, you either give up or you go your own way. Um, and I, so I think the only way to navigate it is to actually talk about it and try and figure out uh, some sort of compromise for each of you. Um, and I think, I'll, you know, I, th I think some women, um, once they understand why it's important and how important it is for their, their husband, um, will actually work on that and start thinking about how they could um, try different things out. Um, and I think it's a bit of trial and error after prostate cancer treatment in particular. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the answer. But I think it's, yeah, it's a huge issue. I know Bettina Arndt has written a lot of books about it if you're interested in reading some book, interesting books. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks very much for your uh, speech today. It's very good. I find if um, your testosterone levels are lo very low, is there any other way to increase that? Or was it through diet or was it through exercise? Or yeah, testosterone's a tricky one. Again, mm. not being a medical expert, I probably shouldn't guide you, but um, there's a difference between having a low testosterone and feeling like you've got a low testo testosterone. So the only way you can know for sure is to have a blood test and your GP would be able to organise that. Um, there, there's, there's two schools of thought in prostate cancer. Some specialists uh, will tell you that you definitely can't have testosterone replacement therapy if you've had prostate cancer. And then there's a newer wave of research that's saying that it might be okay for men to have testosterone when they have prostate cancer. So it really depends on your doctor. So, Thanks yeah. very much. But the other thing to think about is um, exercise. So we know that muscle, muscle mass and building up your physical body can actually improve that sense of um, the, the same sort of feelings that testosterone does. So if you get into the gym, it might help too. I too would like to thank you very much for your um, speech this afternoon. You um, have just uh, again mentioned exercise. It is a very important part. I belong to PROST, um, which is an exercise group operating out of Subiaco Football Club. Yep. We'd love to see any men there. This is an advertisement. Oh, I gathered that. I can see Joe sitting over there as well. <laughs> and uh, it, it is a very important thing, and it's a great support group as well. We all talk, yep. we all have fun, and we all work hard. Yep. Thank you. I, I agree with you. If, you. if you're not exercising, find, find a group you can do it with, because it, it's great. Your question's probably the same question someone next to you is asking, so thank you. Thanks, Aidy. It's great to see you over here. Sorry, I haven't got much of a voice today. Um, I was just curious, in Victoria, is a psychological um, appointment part of um, standard care? Um, I'd really love to see more of that happening over here. So just wondering what the experience mm. is in Victoria. It depends where you go. In Victoria, uh, we're at the Royal Melbourne, um, where we do have a psychologist in the urology department. It is standard care, so we try and see everyone before they have surgery and then afterwards as well. That is really, really, really rare. Um, there's hardly any services that have staff. Um, but you can find a psychologist yourself through your GP. So Medicare now covers 10 sessions of psychology uh, counselling. So you shouldn't be, you might be a little bit out of pocket, but not too much out of pocket. Um, so I, I think that's probably the best bet. If, you're, if your urologist can refer you to somebody, then that's great. But otherwise, if your GP can refer you, then that, that's the, the second best option, I think. Thank you. I think it's a really important aspect for care. Thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> with Sestris here. Addie, hello, my name's Amelia Hay, I'm from Prostate Cancer Foundation and I coordinate the support groups in Western yes, Australia. Very and I just point. wanted to say how it's so good to hear people talk about the emotional and the psychological issues that people have and it's so underestimated and undervalued the importance of getting support for people. Yeah. I'd just like to say that we have 21 support groups in WA wow. and that you can access through the PCFA website. There are many leaders in this room today uh, who I'm sure would be happy to talk to you and that's one way of access accessing support, talking to other people and helping uh, you to be able to talk to perhaps your spouse as well yep. while doing that. We encourage partners obviously to come along as well. So yep. thank you, it was a great talk, thanks very much. I agree with you. If you haven't been to a support group, check it out. And I, th I think maybe the thing to remember too with support groups is if the first one you go to doesn't quite fit with you or you don't meet people that you connect with, try another one because they're all very different and they have different ways of operating. So find the one that you feel right in. Lovely. Look, I think we'll have to finish there because it's almost half past. But please do join me again in, in thanking Eddie for coming today to talk with us. <laughs> now, please don't go. I would, I would just like to say a few things. Um, and, and importantly, we're talking about exercise programs and counselling, and I'd just like to remind you that the Cancer Council has a statewide counselling service available, so please do access that through our helpline number 13 11 20. We do have a statewide network for counselling. If people are looking for that support, we can certainly help you with that. And also we have an exercise program, an eight-week free exercise program through our Life Now program at the Cancer Council. And again, that's the 13 11 20 number that you can access that and find out when the next start date is and that might be something that gets you on that road to doing some more physical activity, which uh, will have additional benefits and not just for some of the issues that Addie talked about. Um, also, please do complete your evaluation form. It's really important for us. And next topic is the 6th of October and I just want to let you know that it's a different venue. So if anyone's planning on coming, it's going to be at the Harry Perkins Institute for Medical Research, which is on the grounds of the Queen Elizabeth II Medical Centre in Nedlands, Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Verdon Street there. So it's a brand new building. It is going to be hard to find, and we're really trying to let everybody know that it's a different place. So for our regular people, please don't come here on the 6th of October. We'll be in a different spot. But thank you very much uh, for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>